We are Gold Ivy, a health company dedicated to simplifying health and wellness. Tune in as we search to find the deep, real, and raw truth. We're here to talk big, no room for small talk. It is our mission to inspire, seek growth, simplify the action steps, and build confidence. You decide what works for your daily life and how to transform our lessons into your gold. Are you ready to step into your power? Now is the time. Join us on the fearless pursuit of self-discovery and growth. This is Ivy Unleashed, a Gold Ivy production. Hi, I'm Britt, the creator and founder of PNTY, granola bars that say please and thank you. I started this company to remind people the power of manners and respect. Even when we don't agree with someone or care for them, we can still show them respect. And through that respect, we can strengthen our community. We love your granola and bars, and their names are so cute. The Golden Rule, Pardon Me, You're Welcome, Sharing is Caring. We're curious why you decided to share this message with granola bars specifically. It's a fun, easy, daily way to share an important message. My products are especially crafted in a way to be inherently good for you. Pantry-friendly ingredients, well-balanced, and packaged in an earth-friendly way. It's full circle. Take care of yourself. Be mindful of your community. Think about your earth. They are simply a daily reminder of that. Love that. Your Yes Please Granola has officially made me a breakfast person. It's hands down the best granola I've ever had. I pair it with Greek yogurt, berries, and chia, and I look forward to it every morning with my coffee. I love that it's gut-friendly, being gluten-free, and has a dairy-free option, too. Britt, where can our listeners find your delicious granola, and what kind of deal can you give them? You can find me on Instagram at ptygranolaco, and order from my shop page, www dot pty granola company dot com iv unleashed listeners can use this promo code gold ivy at checkout for a 10 percent discount amazing thank you brett nice use of manners brooke thank you <laughs> i truly treasure new connections and i'm so excited when i get to make granola bars and i'm able to share a snack food that i believe wholeheartedly in so grab my granola bars and granola whenever you want but make sure to use your manners please and thank you Welcome to part two of Alan Stein Jr.'s debut on Ivy Unleashed. We are so happy you are here. Today's episode is full of life-shattering lessons and laughs. Alan Stein Jr. spent 15 plus years working with the highest performing basketball players on the planet, including NBA superstars Kevin Durant, Steph Curry, and Kobe Bryant. Now as an experienced keynote speaker and author of Raise Your Game and Sustain Your Game, Alan shares his gold in new ways. In part two, you'll hear Alan dive deep into burnout, grind culture, the abundance mindset, and so much more. We appreciate you listening and always hope you find value in our lessons. If you're open to it and would be so kind, please leave a review of what you found helpful. Or if you feel like that's too much for you, please just tap the five stars. Our show is free for you, just like tapping the five stars. And it just takes two seconds. Thank you. (laughs) And if you didn't hear episode 91, do yourself a favor and listen when you get a chance. And now to today's episode of the Ivy Unleashed podcast. And and this has been hard because I grew up with in a household with a scarcity mentality instead of an abundance mentality. So that's another one of the things that I'm trying to rewire in my life is, is being able to say, yeah, there's plenty for everybody that I don't need to be a squirrel, you know, hogging all of my nuts. It's okay to share them. Mm-hmm. And I just said, share my nuts on a, on a <laughs> podcast. That is, yes, he did, ladies and is, gentlemen. That is not what I meant by that. No. But yeah, so I'm trying to rewire from going from a scarcity mentality to an abundant mentality. And that's not, that's not easy either. Yeah. It's staying in your lane. Yes. Is what I'm hearing. The comparison is the thief of joy. They say that for a reason. Mm-hmm. I think with us too, we're on social media. We're constantly seeing people that have more followers that have bigger guests that are doing bigger things. And it's the, oh, well, they're already doing it. So why would I even try? Yeah. Like that's the opposite. So yes. you working on an abundance mindset, what yeah. are those practices, those tools that you have to help you switch your script? Well, it all comes back to awareness and it comes back to patience. So I have to be aware of when I'm living through a scarcity lens and then just say, all right, you, you, you don't have to view it this way. You know, it's, it's life does not need to be zero sum, you know? Just because they chose you to be the keynote speaker instead of me doesn't make me less than unless I choose 
to make me feel less than. And that's the other part. I mean, in the speaking industry in general, I, I mean, I think in Vegas alone, there are like 6,000 speaking events in any given year. I mean, it is astronomical. So while I'm over here in my feelings, crying and worried about one event I didn't get, there are literally tens of thousands of other events that I can get. It's If someone said there's a finite number, there's only going to be 100 speaking engagements this entire year in this entire country, and you don't get one, then you're like, okay, well, now I guess I'm in a little bit of trouble. That's not the case. You know, we talked earlier also, I know I keep referencing that. We had a wonderful conversation in the, the car at 515 this morning when these <laughs> ladies picked me up. But like looking, uh, you know, at the dating world and and same thing. So you, you meet someone that that checks all the boxes and you think would be an amazing partner. And then for whatever reason, they're not. I have difficulty thinking, well, that's okay. Cause there's going to be somebody else out there that can still meet. Like there's no shortage of people that I believe I could be a good fit for. And, and I don't mean to go down a tangent, whether someone believes in soulmates or not, that's fine. I, I don't believe that there's one. I believe there's plenty of people that, that could be a wonderful partner for me moving forward. But that's where, that really is where it triggers for me. So I'm in a relationship, things go really well, and then they don't go well. And now I'm thinking, oh my God, did I, should I be sacrificing who I am and what's important to me to make this work? Because there might not be another person out there that's good enough. That's, that's slippery. That's so, so I'm trying common. to rewire myself. People Absolutely. That, yeah. So I'm trying to rewire myself and, and, and not to, not to dehumanize anyone, but it's, you know, the, the example, you know, you, you miss the bus, there's going to be another bus coming around the corner. <laughs> and that is not to compare young ladies to buses, but just, just simply say that if it doesn't work, that's okay. Mm-hmm. But then, but then this is where all of these things start to trigger because I still have the temptation to, when you meet someone, you want to put your best foot forward. Mm-hmm. You, you want them to be impressed by you. I want them to think I'm cool that I'm doing, you know, but you have to be authentic. You have to be real. Cause if you put a fake you know, a facade up and they think you're cool for the first couple of weeks and then they get to know who you really are and you ain't cool, then you're going to have a problem. So yeah. I've learned to be comfortable just being me right from the beginning. And that's the ultimate qualifier. And if me being me is not the right fit for you, then that's okay. Mm-hmm. And if you decide that it's the not right fit for you, it still might sting. I still might like you and kind of want this to work out. And then when it doesn't, it's a gut punch but then I move to the next play. I give myself 24 hours to uh, binge watch some Netflix and think, woe is me. But then just wake up the next day and say, all right, well, let's give this another go. So oh, the, the, the yeah. dating world is the ultimate EQ laboratory for me to work on all of these things. So it's it's been good practice to say yeah, the least. Yeah, I was going to say, but it's good practice for anything, for business, being aligned with what you want and what your business stands for as you build it. Like if people say no to us, whatever, we're staying true to what aligns with us. Or as you're making a friend and you're trying to impress a random friend with these cool stories, just like be yourself because eventually they're going to see who you really are. You can't I, sustain that game. I, yeah, honestly, <laughs> I feel like this that could apply to anything. And yeah, dating's got to be so tricky. But I think a lot of people feel that way. Like, you know, there's the timeline of, okay, but I want, I don't want to wait five more years, you know, like, should I just settle because they're like kind of okay, but then you're sacrificing who you are, which is going to lead to resentment. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that can literally be applied to any part of your life and just how important being authentic is and being alignment is. And that's a huge part of your book of sustaining your game is like, if you're feeling burned out, you're probably not aligned with what's important to you. So can you kind of speak to how you can get realigned or like even start with alignment so that you don't burn out. You, you just said you teed it up perfectly. So uh, burnout is misalignment between the sacrifices you're making and the hours you're putting in and the meaning you find in the work that you're doing or in the relationship that you're having. It's not just for work. So if you don't find meaning or purpose in what you do, you are at risk for burnout. If you are not curious by or fascinated by what you're doing, you're at risk for burnout. If what you're doing is not in alignment with your core values and your deepest held beliefs, you're at risk for burnout. If you don't believe the work you're doing is contributing to something bigger than yourself and you're, you're making a difference, you're at risk for burnout. So it's not just from long hours. That, that is a contributing factor. But we all know someone. You two are a perfect example. I mean, you've got full-time jobs and you're working on the side to build this business. You're putting in a lot of time, but you find so much meaning in what you're doing that, that you guys are so vivacious and so alive and so into this. As soon as you would stop finding meaning at that, that's when you're at risk. So um, it's not just the long hours. Because you can balance long hours if you take care of yourself physically, mentally, and emotionally. I mean, 
So you're capable of working 60 hours a week and not getting burnt out if you love the work that you're doing. But that's the key. And, and not a lot of people love the work that they're doing for the long periods of time in the long haul. So that's when you have to look to make some tweaks. If we just use a generic example, you're working in a typical corporate structure and you've been there for 15 years and you're starting to feel some burnout, you know, ask yourself, you know, well, first of all, what has changed between now and when I started? Maybe they moved you to a different department. Maybe you used to have a, a work BFF, but they went to a different job. Um, maybe the, your role has changed and what you're being asked to do. Maybe you have a new boss. Like a lot of these things could have changed and that could have thrown things out of alignment. So you can look to tweak some of those internal things. Uh, you guys will see today during the keynote, that's one of the things I talk about is, is finding meaning in your work and, and deeply connecting to the why you do what you do. Why would you work 60 hours? If the answer is for a paycheck, that usually does not require the meaning to sustain that. If it's because I believe what our company does is making a huge difference in people's lives and I actually get to see the lives that we have a chance to impact, then you're, you're at less risk of burnout. So on the, the, the shorter end of the spectrum or the smaller end of the spectrum, you can make some tweaks internally. Um, ask your boss if you can switch to a different department, take on a different role, move your cubicle somewhere else. Like you can try those things. If that doesn't work, then you may need a full reinvention. You may need to leave the basketball space and become a keynote speaker. That was why I left. I started to feel burnout on being a basketball performance coach. I loved the kids I was working with. I loved the coaches I was serving. I was no longer fascinated by sets and reps and, and designing programs. You know, I no longer found meaning in having kids run faster and jump higher and dunk basketballs. That just, it did, it, that filled my cup for 15 years and I loved every second of it. But then it stopped having that meaning and I was finding more meaning in leadership, in culture, in communication, in the things that I speak about now. So that was why I made, made the shift. And if in 10 years from now, this is no longer providing meaning, then I'll just shift to do something else. I believe as long as I'm developing skills with high utility, then I can do anything that I want. Leadership has high utility. Communication has high utility. Emotional intelligence has high utility. And those are all areas that I still need to continue to up level but no matter what, I'll be able to find a home for those skill sets because we need them in every area of our life. Mm -hmm. I love two things from what you just said that I think are so important at home is that you are consistently aligning with where you're at and that can change over time. And you give yourself permission to change your mind on what you want to do. I think sometimes we get stuck in this job or you decide to be a stay at home mom. Like for me, I, I tried it and it it was burning me out because I wasn't getting the value anymore. It was nice when she was a baby, but as she became a toddler, I was like, I'm not the Pinterest mom. I, I don't, not getting anything out of this. And I, and I don't think she is either. You know, I think somebody else would be more equipped to do this. And so I think allowing yourself to know that you evolve and then actually tapping into what you want and realigning, like, when do you take that time to evaluate where you're at? And what you just said takes courage too. Like we need to, we need to be able to celebrate the things that we do well. You know, a lot of us have that inner critic that's always telling us the things we're doing wrong, but I mean, it takes courage to make some of these big changes. It takes courage to leave a relationship. It takes courage to leave a job. It takes courage to switch vocations. You know, I mean, these, these things take courage and, and sometimes I don't think we celebrate that enough. Uh, we tend to ostracize that, but I, I think that's, yeah, that that's huge. And I've always believed also using another old adage that, you know, you, you can't pour anything out of an empty cup. So our first rule our, our first non-negotiable needs to make sure our cup is always filled. That's how you become the best parent, the best spouse, the best fill in the blank is making sure your cup is filled. So one of the first things I had to do, um, which is interesting, as I told you all for the first 40 years, I was a rather selfish person in general, but I've had to realize that filling my cup first is not an act of selfishness. It's an act of selflessness because the fuller my cup is, the more I can share with others and, and, and kind of go back to that candle analogy. If my flame goes out, I can't light any other candles. So job number one is to keep my flame lit. And I do that in a variety of different ways. And making sure you're aligned with what it is that you're doing is one of those primary ways and give yourself that grace. Now, this is also not to be confused with a minor slump, like with, you know, I mean, sometimes you're going to go through a few days where work is just kind of a pain in the backside and you're not loving your job that I'm not saying everything needs to be this massive red flag. 
But if you're starting to know weeks on end, I'm not looking forward to Monday morning. I'm not looking forward to going into the office. I don't like to, then, mm-hmm. then you may want to make a, a switch and, um, and keep those options open. I think what, what prevents people from doing a lot of these things is we worry about what everyone else is going to say. Generally speaking, I have had tremendously supportive people in my life. I have not had a lot of people tell me you can't do that or you shouldn't do that. And I know a lot of people have an uphill battle because they have those naysayers in their life. So when I said I'm leaving basketball to be a keynote speaker, I had a lot of people ask why, but I didn't have anyone go, oh my God, you're insane. Why are you doing that? You'll never succeed at that. I mean, I had good people in my life, but I certainly had a lot of people say why. Like you spent 15 years working towards the top of your like brand recognition and some of these opportunities. Why would you give that up? And the answer was because it's not filling my bucket anymore. That's why. And I can't make it. So I enjoyed it while I did it. And I I loved every minute of it, but it's just not, it's not doing it for me anymore. And I, I believe I owe that to myself, but I also owe that to the people I was working with. You know, I, I don't think teaching and coaching and mentoring and the things that we all do and the playgrounds we play on are things that you can just mail in. Like you got to be all in, you know, I don't think anything would be more disheartening than a half-assed teacher. Those are our youth that you're pouring into. That is the future of our world and you're mailing it in every day. That's unacceptable. Now it's completely acceptable that you don't love teaching. There's nothing wrong with that, but you need to get out of the game because now you're having, you're detracting from other people. And uh, that's one of the reasons that I love teachers so much is most teachers, they're in it to win it. They're not doing it for the pay. They're certainly not doing it for any type of accolades or recognition. They're doing it because they believe in pouring into young people. But if you're a teacher listening to this and the moment you no longer want to pour into young people, please find something else to do that can utilize your greatness and don't feel guilty about it. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing says that when you decide to be a teacher, you have to do it for 30 years. If after three, you want to do something else, by all means, knock yourself out. You should. Yeah. I love it's trusting yourself to own it to do whatever you're being called to do and to go all in and not care what others are saying because at the end of the day, it's your life. And that kind of leads me to my next question, which is what you talk about with the performance gap of the knowing it and the actually doing it. We can talk about the fundamentals or anything in life. I'm curious why you believe there is such a big gap between knowing it and actually doing it. Because most of the things that we know are hard to do. (laughs) I mean, if it was easy, everyone else would be doing it. And we know that. Now, we chose to find some enjoyment in what we did this morning. There's nothing easy about getting up at 4.30 in the morning and doing the workout that you guys drug me through uh, for 30 minutes. That is challenging to do. It would be much easier to sleep in instead of doing that. We all recognize that. But because we find meaning in it and because it gets our endorphins going and it makes us feel good, like we found weight, but it's not, it's not easy to do. So part of it, I think, is just the acknowledgement. But that is where people get tricked up and where people get frustrated. It's rarely from lack of knowing it's from lack of doing, Mm -hmm. you know, even, even today, later today at the keynote, we could do this survey. We don't have time, but I I could say, all right, everybody take out pen and paper and write down the 10 healthiest foods that you know of. And everyone would write them down. And I bet you we'd see a lot of the same foods on a lot of the same pieces of paper. And then I could say, okay, uh, how many hours of sleep are you supposed to get every night? Write that number down. Everyone would write a number down immediately. Most of them would write down the same number and then say, how many of you, you know, can you just etch out what you should do on a weekly basis as far as moving your body, as far as physical fitness? You don't, you don't have to design a workout and submit it to men's or women's health, but generally speaking, just what should you do? And every single person would be able to write down what they're supposed to do. And then I can simply ask them, okay, uh, are those the foods you eat? consistently. Is that the amount of sleep you got last night? And are these the type of workouts you do four to five days a week? And for the people that are being honest, you're going to see a lot of heads saying no, but it's not from lack of knowledge. They know exactly what to do. They just wrote it down. They're just not doing it. So to me, that's, that's pivotal to my work is, is finding the thorn in people's paws and figuring out how to take that out so that now they start doing the things they know they should do. But some of it starts with the awareness Some of it starts with, you know, lack of, don't, don't self-loathe and beat yourself up. Don't feel guilty. Don't say I haven't worked out for the last 10 years. Say, but I can work out this morning. Mm -hmm. You can't change the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. You'll never get that back. And the more you think about that, then the more, the the lower you feel. So yeah, you can't do anything about those 10 years, but you can work out this morning and just take it one, one day at a time. 
Yeah, Brooke and I have a coach and she always has us say, uh, up until now, <laughs> like maybe, okay, it's irrelevant that you were bad at that before, up until now and moving forward, I am a person. I do identify as somebody that is going to exercise five days a week. And I do think there's something about why people have such tough times mentally, knowing that they, they have the knowledge and they're not doing it. Like you said, you kick yourself up, like you beat yourself up about it or you're down on yourself, which I think makes it even harder to get started. Yes. You know, that performance gap is even worse because you are thinking of the past or you are thinking about what you're bad at. Yes. But if you, if you look at life through the lens of I'm broken, I need fixing and I have to do these things in order to be whole, then you're in trouble. If you can give yourself some grace and, and, and I don't like just being able to say, I, I'm good as is. Whether I go for a run today or not does not determine whether or not I'm a good human being. I'm going to prefer to go for a run because it makes me feel better and it's, it's moving me closer to my goals. But let's, let's not start in the hole of thinking we have to do all of these things because then when we don't do them, that's when the guilt and the shame piles on and the self-criticism. So we're all doing the best we can with what we got. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's another thing that's really changed the way that, that I look at the world is I try and be to help me improve my patience and my compassion is, and this can be naive at times, I make the assumption that every human being I meet is doing the best they can mm -hmm. with the tools they have and the awareness they have. Now, clearly there's a lot of people that aren't aware and there's a lot of people that don't have very many tools. We got a few people walking around, all they got is a hammer. That's all they have. But if all you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. Like, can you be, how can you get frustrated at someone? They're doing the best that they can. And that's where I've learned to give myself forgiveness because even the previous, the selfish, and I'm painting myself like I was a bad guy. I was never a bad guy. I've always been a high character guy with a good heart. But yeah, I had selfish tendencies built out of insecurity. I was impatient. I was easily frustrated, like all of those things. But I've forgiven that guy because even me then was doing the best I could with what I had. Mm -hmm. I just didn't have very many tools then. So now mm -hmm. I'm trying to add tools to my toolbox, then most importantly, yeah. be able to use them. But I, I'm a huge believer in starting slow and being very strategic. So if anyone listening to this, if you feel like your entire life is a mess and you need to change everything, that is an incredibly overwhelming feeling. Like you feel like you're going to drown. So don't. Just, just pick one thing. Mm -hmm. Just say, hey, just starting tomorrow morning, I'm going to go for a walk every morning. That's it. You don't need to change anything else. You don't need to buy a Peloton bike. You don't need to throw out everything from the pantry. You don't need to hire six trainers and four therapists. Just go for a walk mm -hmm. and start to make that stick. And then once you've got that habit, in addition to walking, listen to a wonderful podcast like this and add that to the list. And then after you've become, that's become a habit. When you get back from your walk and listening to your podcast, make a yummy smoothie. Uh, shout out to Chef Justin for making an amazing <laughs> smoothie this morning um, and add that to the list. And then maybe after your smoothie, you can take a few minutes to read a few pages of a book that makes you feel good. And you can start to stack these things on top of each other and slowly dig yourself out of this perceived hole. Mm -hmm. But just remind yourself that if you don't do any of that, you're still worthy and you're still a good person and you still deserve love and affection. Like it's, it's okay. So that we, we just can't start from a place of being a place of being broken. That was so beautiful. I'm so glad you said that because that's what gets pe That's what holds people back. These self-limiting beliefs mm -hmm. and getting overwhelmed by all that you could be doing. It's very overwhelming. So mm -hmm. I love that. Well, if, if we're just going to keep piling on things that I used to do that I <laughs> need to do better, the self-limiting beliefs is a major one because I, I used to aim low to increase the chance I would reach goals. I, I'm, what I'm trying to expand in my life right now is to dream much bigger and because I've put so many self-limiting beliefs on what I'm capable of because I used to look at the world through that paradigm we've discussed earlier that falling short of a goal means you're a failure mm -hmm. and I don't want to fail or I don't want to be viewed as a failure, failure, you know? So if I aim lower, then I have a higher percentage chance that I'll hit, but you also live a much more tepid, mediocre life. So now I'm trying to, to stretch and expand and aim much higher and just realize that I'm not going to hit all of those goals. In fact, most of them I don't, but I still make progress and I still learn something and then I can chase that goal again uh, if, if I want. So I'm, I'm trying to be much more open to, to stretching and, and, but, but when you start lining all these things up, like rewiring, going from a scarcity mindset to an abundant mindset is really hard. I still struggle with it going from, you know, aiming really low to some grandiose goals and beliefs is really, really hard. 
40 years of being impatient and easily frustrated to now just whistle while the slow cashier at Target is ringing people up is not easy. So the number one takeaway from this episode, all of this stuff is basic. None of this stuff is easy. So give yourself some patience, give yourself some grace, and just know that we're all struggling with this. That's the part. I think what makes everything worse in addition to shame and guilt is feeling like you're alone. I'm the only one that doesn't have my life together. Uh, No. I can promise you everyone listening to this right now, including the three of us, doesn't have our life together in some area at some time. But some people are are making progress and, and being okay with that. I'm okay with knowing that I don't have it all figured out. You know, I don't, you know, I'm getting better at being able to lean into uncertainty and knowing I don't have the answers. I don't know the way this game is going to play out. I'm just going to do the best I can with what I have where I am. And, and coupled with that, I'm not going to blame, complain, or make excuses. I'm going to hold myself fully accountable for everything that goes on in my life. And even that statement, I recognize coming from a middle-aged straight white male, the definition of privilege can even be a turnoff because I know there are people out there that have a much, much, much harder road than I've ever had. I mean, I've, I've been incredibly fortunate to have a pretty awesome life. And even with someone else setting the table for an awesome life, I'm still tripped up and struggling and finding problems with all this. So I can only imagine people that have had much bigger adversities to deal with. So I don't mean to make light of those. And I certainly don't ever want to sound like I lack compassion. I know people are fighting much bigger fights than I am. But you still choose on, how, you know, you still get the choice on how you view approaching those things and what you plan to do about them. And uh, that's all we can do. And then we can just try to have a sense of community like you guys are creating and kind of band together and, and be able to say, yeah, I'm having a tough day today. Yeah, that keynote did not go as well as I'd like. Yeah, I asked this girl out and she ghosted me after a week. Like we have, who puts that on social? I got ghosted a couple of weeks ago. I'm telling you guys right now, but I didn't, that, I didn't lead with that on Instagram. <laughs> that was a punch in the gut. Yeah. But it was, it was practice. And, and it hurt for 24 hours. And then I learned some lessons. I sat in my feelings. They were really uncomfortable. I tried not to tell the story of why I thought that it happened because I have no idea why it happened. So it was a good practice. It was a good rep. And next time, if I get ghosted, I'll be a little bit better at handling it. I even went into my therapist and explained that to her about being ghosted. I said, this is the first time I've been ghosted. It's a punch in the gut. And she's like, wait, you've been dating on and off for seven years and that's the first time you've been ghosted. You should be very thankful. That is amazing that you've only dealt with this once. So that just reminded me going back to perspective. Mm -hmm. Her perspective was how fortunate I am that I've only been ghosted once. My perspective was, oh my God, I can't believe I've been ghosted. What did I do? Why am I not good enough? Why am I unworthy? How come she doesn't like me? I mean, and how, how petulant are those thoughts? But I had them, but I only had them for a couple hours. And then I pulled my big boy pants up and said, okay. Next did, play. Yeah, ne- exactly. Next play. There's another bus coming around the corner. <laughs> I missed this bus. This bus didn't come by, but I'm going to find another bus. Yeah. So it's, it's all good practice. And, and time does heal these things. If you give yourself room to breathe and you, you, you have, you know. So to me, that's, that's most important. Yeah. I think with support to its perspective. Being around people, not only is it awesome to not feel alone and to feel like you have that sense of community, but it also gives you perspective of, okay, I am doing okay. I am all right. Yeah. Okay. And life for you now, you have a lot going on. Obviously, keynote, we know that you're a parent, you're dating. Uh, we also know that you're tapping into some stand up comedy, all kinds of things. Oh, so, yeah. what is life like for you now with all the different games you're playing in? Life is appropriately full. That's how I, 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 there's certain words I choose to avoid in my own vernacular because they have a negative emotional connotation with me. You guys struck one of them earlier, which is grind. Uh, I don't ever want to be associated with the word grind. There's nothing I do in my life that I grind through. Do I work really hard? Absolutely. And I'm proud of that work ethic, but the, the word grind doesn't work for me. Doesn't mean it's a bad word. I have friends that use it and it's very empowering and it up. And, what does and they it bring up it. in you? I'm just curious. Like I just picture somebody white knuckling, gritting their teeth and, oh, I got to do, I don't have to do anything. I get to do everything in my life. I don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm very, very thankful and and fortunate that. So the other one is busy. I'm not busy. 
I'm appropriately full because I choose my schedule and I choose what I put on my calendar. Um, busy means I'm doing other people's agendas and other people's work and it feels frantic. Uh, now, there are times where I don't do a masterful job of being appropriately full and I start to feel overwhelmed and busy and then I learn to, to, to take a step back. But um, right now, you know, there's a couple things about that I've learned about myself that I use to design my life. First is I'm heavily introverted. I love solitude. I love alone time. That is where I recharge. When we were talking earlier, you guys asked if I enjoyed my, my day yesterday with nothing on the schedule in Minneapolis. I did because I didn't see another human being. I stayed by myself. I ordered Uber Eats to my room. I got some work done. I rehearsed for my keynote, got a great night rest so that I could hopefully bring the fire to you guys this morning. And I loved it. I quarantined myself off from all of society because I needed that day to recharge. So I know that I'm introverted, which means today I'm with you guys for a couple hours in the morning. Then I'm with that group for several hours and I have to be on the entire time. The moment dinner is over tonight, I cannot wait to get back to my hotel room, take a shower, order some Uber Eats and watch something mindless on TV before I go to sleep, wake up and take a flight home. But I've learned that about myself. And I've learned that if I don't find times to recharge my battery, then tomorrow when I go home and I see my kids, I'm not the best version of myself. I'll be irritable. I'll be grumpy. So I've, I've learned in between speaking engagements and in between childcare, and, and just to make sure we're clear. So I'm very amicably divorced. I was married for five years. I've been divorced for seven. My ex and I are great friends. We get along great. We make great co-parents, but I've learned that the times I don't have my children, I need to refill my tank. The times I'm not speaking, I need to refill my tank. So one introversion Two, I love structure. I love routine. I love consistency. I'm almost militaristic to the point that I like to schedule things out. Um, I'm trying to learn to be more flexible and spontaneous because I know that, that, that not everyone operates uh, the same way that I do. We're all using a slightly different operating system. So I never want to be rigid. I want to be able to, to be adaptable, but I, I like structure. So knowing that I'm introverted and knowing I like structure is kind of how I design my my life and my schedule. And then I only put things on my schedule that are taking me closer to who I'm trying to be and what I'm trying to achieve. So I don't fill my schedule up with things that, that aren't meaningful to me. Um, doesn't mean every single moment of every day is rainbows and puppy dogs and ice cream. Yes, some things have to get done in order to allow me to do the things that I really love to do and find meaning in. But generally speaking, those are kind of the quadrants of my life. I've got my children, which is an incredibly important part of my life. I have my work where I find tremendous meaning. I have things that I'm really interested in doing. And a lot of them are, are training for physical events. And then I make room for relationships or dating. And I told you I'm taking a little break from dating at the moment, getting off of the dating apps. Cause I just, I need a recharge and a reset. You know, I, I need to, to stop swiping for a few moments and <laughs> you just take a couple deep funnier. breaths. Yes. If I could improve my humor, then maybe I could attract a life partner. But until then um, the buses are just going to keep going by. But you are, then. you are working on <laughs> your humor by doing stand up. Yes. So tell us about that. Absolutely. So I like having something on my schedule two to three to six months out that I look forward to and that I'm training for. Um, in the past, I've done a Spartan race, an ultra marathon, hike rim to rim at the Grand Canyon. I just did a Navy SEAL training event. So almost everything that I've done in the last two years has been for the physical. Now, there's also a mental and emotional component to those things, but it's primarily physical. I have to physically be in shape enough to do this thing. But now I'm going to try my hand at doing uh, some open mic nights in the D.C. area and try some stand-up comedy, which won't take any type of physical preparation, but it'll certainly take some mental and emotional preparation as well. And I'm looking forward to it. I've been a huge fan of stand-up comedy, not just because I like to laugh. I, I think most people enjoy laughing, but I've always studied the craft of it. I've been mesmerized by, by really good stand-up comedians. Um, I think... This is, I'm heavily biased. It is the purest form of spoken word that there is. It is you and a microphone, no props, no slides, nothing else. And you need to make a group of random, usually intoxicated people who are expecting to laugh and have paid money to laugh. You need to make them laugh. I don't know that there's a harder job when it comes to being an orator. So well, especially when you're an introverted structured guy, like, <laughs> yeah. this is like the opposite of what I would picture you doing. Yeah. So it, it is going to take me out of my comfort zone and, and I'm looking forward to it. Um, you know, the, the biggest challenge for me, and I'll make this public what I find the funniest is incredibly off color and politically incorrect. Like the comedians that I gravitate towards who make me belly laugh, 
say some pretty raunchy stuff. That's just the, the sense of humor I have. So I also need to toe a fine line of, you know, I, I am a father. I want to be respected in the community. I take my work very serious. So I, I don't want to do anything that could tarnish my brand. So I'm a little bit in limbo. And it's not that I don't think that, mm -hmm. that there, it's possible to be funny and be clean at the same time. I just know what makes me laugh. And for me to be truly authentic and, and pure, I can go to some dark places. And so that it's going to take some nuanced skill to do some of these things. But I'm looking forward to it. Now, I, as I told you guys, you only see a small part of the snapshot. So what most people see is Alan said he's going to try some stand-up comedy. He's going to sign up for some open mic nights. And then a month later, he's going to actually do it. Wow, he's pretty courageous. I can't believe he's doing that. I started telling myself this 10 years ago. So it's taken 9.8 years for me to get the courage to actually pull the trigger and do it. So that goes back to the six no's for every one yes. You know, I've been sitting on this forever. I wanted to try my hand at stand-up comedy in my mid-30s, and I'm now, you know, staring down the barrel of 50, and I'm going to finally give it a try. So it's taken some time. But what I realized was what was holding me back was I never set the date. Mm. You know, if I say on this date I have to be prepared for a 26-hour Navy SEAL challenge, then I have to be prepared. There ain't no backing out of that. Yep. But I always just gave myself an out. Yeah, maybe I'll, maybe I'll try some open mics next month. And then it never comes around. So that was why I put that out on social and why I'm saying it on programs like this. It's the ultimate accountability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't back out now because there's no way I'm looking all those people in the eye and saying I chickened out. So I'm going to do it. But because I love preparation and structure. So I've already gone to several open mic nights and I've scouted them out because I wanted to see what the room feels like. I want to see what the audience is like. Not that I'm competing with anyone else, but I want to see the level of open micer. And uh, let's just say I'll be okay. <laughs> I'm going to be okay. Yeah, I don't think they're going to be offering any Netflix specials to the people that go to these open mics. So I like my chances, um, but it's going to be fun. But here, here's what's fascinating. So we mentioned earlier when I said I was struggling a little bit during that workout downstairs because I'm not in hit type of shape right now. I'm in long distance, steady running shape. And that was good. That was why it was awesome for me to do that. Well, even from a speaking standpoint, today you guys will see me speak for 60 minutes and I'll barely take a breath and won't miss a syllable. And then I'll be on a panel for 60 minutes and we'll have no, so I can do two hours standing on my head. And yet coming up with four minutes of stand up material is going to be really challenging. Wow. That's going to be really hard. And I'm looking forward to it. Now, I, I like the science and the art, like the craft of it. So I don't, I'm not going to wing it. That was one of the things that when I noticed these other open micers, I felt like they were just kind of getting up there and winging mm -hmm. it. I don't believe in doing that. I believe time is our most precious resource and our attention in the present moment is the number one currency we have to play. And I don't believe in wasting people's time or attention. So I'm not implying that I'm going to be super funny for four minutes. What I can promise you is I'll be prepared. Whatever I do up there, I will have planned to say, I will have rehearsed it. Now, whether the audience thinks it's funny is out of my control, right. but it won't, be, it won't be from lack of preparation. And I do that because I respect the audience. And I respect that if you're going to put your eyes on me for four straight minutes, that I owe you the best that I'm capable of. And anything less than that, I think is disrespectful. So I'm, I will give it my best. And then it'll be interesting because the keynote speaking and stand-up, the feedback is real time. If I'm not funny, it will be inherently <laughs> awkward while I'm standing You're there. Sit in that. Yes. And <laughs> the crickets or the but, but, laughter. But that goes back to learning how to be okay with that. That's mm -hmm. one of the reasons I'm doing it is I want to strengthen that muscle. Uh, you know, you guys will see in my keynote today. Now, nothing in my keynote is supposed to be like, ha ha ha, this guy's really funny. But there are a few things I say that usually elicit a decent chuckle or a smile or, you know, like you want to add a little bit of humor to it. But I do maybe six things that are kind of funny over a 60 minute keynote. So that's one every 10 minutes in stand up comedy. You need a laugh every 10 seconds. That's a, that's a different speed. Wow. So in four minutes, I got to pack a pretty good punch and uh, it's going to be interesting. But the other thing is I also recognize this is not going to be a one and done. I'm not doing one four minute open mic and then not doing it again. I'm going to sign up for probably eight to 10 of them right off the bat because whatever I do that first time is going to be the worst that I'll ever do. Like that's the rite of passage. Mm -hmm. I can tell you right now, the first keynote I ever gave was the worst keynote I've ever given. Now there've been a couple bumps in the road since then, but generally speaking, the trend is working towards improvement. So why would I make a permanent decision based on the fact that I know going into it that my first four minutes is going to be my worst? 
Now, the next time I sign up, that four minutes should be a little better. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to go from the worst to the white Dave Chappelle in, in mm-hmm. you know, one transition, but can I make it a little bit better? And this also goes back to the listening. So I do four minutes and I don't get the response that I want. So that's the audience's way of telling me that's not very funny to us. So then I need to figure out, was it the timing? Was it the material? Uh, should the, the joke I did at the end, should I have done it at the beginning? Um, should I, you know, sh- should I use a different word? So maybe this word wasn't as funny. Yeah. So it's, there's going to be some fun to it. So my goal, assuming this goes well, is to craft four minutes and to keep working on that four minute block until I feel like that four minutes is pretty decent. And then I'll shelve that and I'll start over with a new four minutes and then I'll do the same process. My goal is to see if I can build up 20 to 25 minutes of pretty good material that I could maybe one day be like the third opener at a local comedy club. So, so graduate from open mics to doing something and we shall see. And then the last thing I'll say is I've had so many people, uh, friends in the area say, well, let us know when you're going to do it so we can come support you. And I said, no way, because I want to, I appreciate the support. And that is very kind and thoughtful of you to reach out, but I don't need any pity laughs. I want to earn every laugh Mm -hmm. so that I know that if my four minutes, if people are laughing, those are genuine laughs. You know, I don't want a bunch of people there making me feel good over time. Yeah. Once I do get that Netflix special, you guys can be there for the taping, but for the first four minutes, I want to earn all of it. So I'm not telling anyone, I won't know a soul when I walk in, I'll sign up, I'll do my four minutes and we'll see what happens. Oh, I can't wait. Two things. One, that's on doing it step by step and getting better 1% every time. Mm-hmm. Two, we dibs on being the VIP guests oh, for absolutely. that. <laughs> That's weak. You guys will certainly get the invite. So, okay. So here's my, my, my real plan too. So I used to, and I didn't do it this time prior to the pandemic. Like I, I like barbershop culture. There's something about going to, to tradi- not like salons. And I've been to plenty of those. I'm a little fancy boy, but we can tell. yeah, yeah. I get my nails did. Um, I, I like barbershop culture there, there, there's, there's just something about it. So what I used to do is when I would travel before the pandemic, uh, I would always find a local barber and I would get a skin fade or whatever my hairstyle was at that time. And I would find an off, not, not a super cuts or any, any type of franchise, but a legitimate down home barber. And I just enjoyed doing that. So mm-hmm. every time before every speaking engagement, the night before I would get my hair cut. So now my goal is to switch that in every city I go to find if there is an open mic and then start doing that and just making that part of my routine. It'll get me out of my hotel room and ordering Uber Eats. It'll actually inject me into society and be amongst the people. Uh, it will allow me to try my craft in different places. I just think it'll be fun to do. Yeah. And most major cities will have some type of option. So that's going to be my plan is the night before I speak, you know, warm up the old pipes with a little uh, stand up comedy and then go through my pre speaking routine the next morning and do my thing. So love that. uh, that's going to be the goal. So we'll see. I'll keep you guys posted. That's awesome. I love the accountability you have with yourself and yes. putting it out there too. And you don't want people to come to those, but we do want people to know where to find you and you are literally everywhere. So let's talk about where people can get your book, where they can follow you, where they can find you. Uh, AllensteinJr.com is the primary hub and that's for anyone interested in anything speaking related. Uh, and then I have a supplemental site, StrongerTeam.com, uh, which has info on the podcast, the books. I have an online course and I do some one-on-one coaching. Uh, I'm very accessible and responsive on social media. So at Alan Stein Jr. on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Um, and then you can find Raise Your Game or Sustain Your Game on Amazon or Audible or wherever you get your books and audio books. Uh, if any part of this conversation resonated, if someone wants to ask a question, if someone wants to share a thought, uh, please shoot me a DM on Instagram. Um, would love to keep the conversation going. Love answering questions. And, and don't forget, being introverted means that's where I derive energy. It doesn't mean I don't like people. It doesn't mean I'm antisocial. There's nothing I would rather be doing than this conversation and then going to do a keynote. All I'm saying is at the end of that, I will be exhausted and I need to recharge. So I love engaging with people. I appreciate people. I appreciate you two very much. This was so much fun. And uh, yeah, thank you guys so much. Oh, we're so grateful you're here and we get to hang out with you all day and watch you do your thing even more. So for everyone listening, two steps. First step is go follow Alan online on Instagram. Or in person, just follow me around. It's borderline (laughs) creepy, but help yourself. If you want to set up a blind date, (laughs) message us and we'll set it up. No, but first step is follow him. Second step is get this book, raise your game and sustain your game. Will completely change your game and up level your life. We cannot recommend it enough. Mm -hmm. 
And we want some more gold from you. So, Alan, your three gold stars for our audience. These are your three takeaways. What are your three gold stars? Whatever it is that you're trying to up-level in your life, figure out what the basic building blocks are, the fundamentals of that specific area, get crystal clear in what they are, and then work relentlessly towards improving them and mastering them during the unseen hours. This is true in, in being uh, for your relationship. This is true for being a parent. This is true for any skill, any vocation. Get crystal clear on the basics and work relentlessly towards those, um, I would say, is one. Uh, number two, get crystal clear on the person that you're trying to become. So not not your to-do list, not what you're trying to check off, not external uh, accolades or, or achievements. Who do you want to become? And then make sure the decisions you make in the present are in alignment with becoming that person. But don't try to bat a thousand. Don't aim for perfection. Not everything you do or say is going to be in alignment with who you're trying to become. Uh, so give yourself some grace. And lastly, I guess I'll piggyback on that. Uh, you're not broken. Uh, you are worthy. Just, just do the best you can with what you have wherever you are. Uh, don't blame, complain, or make excuses. Hold yourself fully accountable. And just know wherever you are, you're not alone. We're all going through the struggle. We're all challenged. We're all facing adversity. Um, so, so be okay with that. Lean into that uh, instead of trying to avoid it or think anything's wrong with you. You're definitely not broken. God, it's like you're a motivational speaker or something. <laughs> I, need, I need to be today at 1.30. <laughs> Up next is Unleashing Ivy. So these are three rapid fire surprise questions for you. Ooh. Before we get into it, I just want to say thank you so much for this book, for your podcast, for your other book, for the message that you're putting into the world. And the biggest thing that I keep thinking about is you are a male and everything we're talking about is mental health and there's so much stigma around it. And so I'm grateful that you're on our podcast as a voice of a male who digs deep, who thinks about what they want out of life and normalizes everything you're saying. Like you're not alone in this. And to keep thinking about the man that you want to be or the person you want to be and that we all beat ourselves up, right? But you're clearly someone that's done therapy and you're okay with talking about it. And so I'm just grateful that you as the male that you are with the success you've had, that you've really digged into how important your mental health is. Thank you. I have a therapy appointment next week. <laughs> I go in for regular tune-ups. Hey, you take your car in to get the oil changed and the tires rotated. We got to do the same thing it's for so ourselves. True. But no, I appreciate your kind words very much. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And we like predominantly have females on this podcast, but I think, you know, we, we love raising male voices too, especially those that are in touch with how important this is to talk about. So uh, my Unleashing Ivy question has to do with you kind of growing up and you as a parent now and how you kind of take these fundamentals and this focus on, you know, doing your best, but having that grace. How were you raised and how is that affecting you as a parent now? I love my parents very much and recognize they did the best they were capable of at the time, but I parent my children very differently than how I was raised. And really everything that we talked about today, I have or will talk about with my children very openly. So all of these concepts, um, from a parenting standpoint, I believe in modeling the behavior I want to see my children emulate. So they may tell you slightly differently, but I don't give them a whole lot of lectures. Every once in a while, they're like, dad, you sound like you're doing one of your keynotes. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, understood. But I just try to model it. You know, I can go home and talk to my kids till I'm blue in the face about the importance of being respectful, or they can just see me being respectful to everything and everyone that I interact with on a daily basis. So I, I model that for them. Uh, I don't have a lot of rules with my children. I believe in letting my children make the vast majority of their decisions, but making sure they understand um, you make the choice, you suffer the consequence. I'm not going to bail you out on that. So if you choose not to go out and practice every single day and then you get cut from the basketball team, I'll still have compassion for you and I'll love you unconditionally. Whether you make the basketball team or not has nothing to do with whether I love you. But I'm here to tell you that if you want to make the basketball team, there are things you can do to increase the chance that that happens. And I'm happy to show you what those things are if you'd like, or you can figure it out on your You're own. You're a good resource for figuring out what to do on a basketball to, court. To try to, but, but, that's, but that's also the funny part because my kids are approaching the age where they're not going to want to hear that from me anymore because I'm dad. Mm -hmm. What does dumb old dad know? And I'm okay with that. You know, I already have coaches and trainers that, that work with my children because I believe it takes a village and I want other people to pour into my kids. I want them to hear other voices. I don't want to be the only voice they hear. I want to make sure they know when they hear mine, it's because it's important, but I don't, I don't want that them to tune that out. So, um, yeah, from a parenting standpoint, 
I do parent very differently. And, uh, and that's not an admonishment of my parents. They did what they could do with the tools they had and mine's different. And that's the other thing about parenting. I have a wonderful deep connection with each of my children right now, but I have no idea whether I'm doing this well or not. And I won't until they're a little bit older. So yeah, we shall see, but I love being a father. Yeah. It's It's a tricky balance of, you know, I'm doing my best with what I know, you know, but I, I panic all the time about whether I'm doing things right, because there are things that our parents did that we wish were different. Right. Sure. But also you coming from where you came from, you have a great mindset and you do like, you are so respectful, like just being with you for a few hours, like you model that you for sure are doing that. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Well, well the, the things that we talked about, the, the previous Alan and the current Alan, I'm incredibly open and transparent and vulnerable with my own children about that mm-hmm. and, and let them know, you know, when I, uh, when I talk about the glory days of me being a player back in the day, it's never to tell them how good I was because I wasn't that good of a player. It's to share them, share with them the mistakes I made. And when I got to college, I had an awful attitude that as soon as I stopped getting meaningful minutes, I blamed the coach. I made excuses. I went out and partied a lot. Like I, when there was a fork in the road, I could have chosen the path of I'm going to get in the gym, work my tail off and earn the right to play more minutes. But it was much easier for me to say the coach is an idiot. He doesn't like me. I'll just go out and party. So I, I explained that to my children. So um, I'm very vulnerable with them. When I do make mistakes, which is all of the time, I acknowledge them. If I'm a little grouchy and I, I, you know, snap at one of my kids, then I apologize and say, Hey, that wasn't because of anything you did. I'm having a little bit of a lousy day, but I'm allowed to have a lousy day. And I appreciate you giving me some grace. I'm not perfect as a father. I'm going to F up, but that's, that's part of the journey. And just know as a kid, you're going to F up a lot and I'm still going to love you and I'm still going to have your back and that's going to be okay. We'll figure this out together. Love that. My question is about the legacy that you want to leave behind. What is it? Legacy is such a fascinating word because I can go in so many different directions. The first thing I think of is my kids. This concept of lighting as many candles as I can, there's no better way to do that than to put three human beings in the world that are kind, compassionate, tolerant, uh, self-assured, have high emotional intelligence and contribute something to the world. I mean, if nothing else, hopefully multiply my impact by three. So um, that's part of it. You know, I would hope that anything that I share uh, on stage or anything that I put in my books, if, if folks find helpful and it's just a little piece of the jigsaw puzzle of their life and it adds some value, maybe that will be part of it. But um, I don't spend a ton of time thinking about legacy. Most of my time is thinking about the present moment and how can I add as much value to the lives around me and to my own life as I can. And then I'll let somebody else sort that out. <clears throat> I do think about my own mortality a lot, uh, not necessarily in a morbid way. But I think it's somewhat healthy, you know, that, you know, we we keep talking about buses as if I'm referencing them as if they're females. So we'll use it in a different context here. If after my keynote, I walk outside and I get hit by a bus and this thing is all over today, you know, who's going to show up at my funeral? Who's going to be a part? Well, since I'm in Minneapolis, you better be there. Yeah. You you guys (laughs) can walk on the red carpet. No, it's actually hilarious. Um, Like that's when I think you find out who, who did you really make an impact on? You know, because it's uh, most people do what's most convenient for them in their life at that moment. But I think, you know, whether you call it a funeral or a celebration of life gives you a little bit of a yardstick of of maybe some of the people that you've had a chance to impact and, and so forth. So so we'll see. So really long answer made considerably concise. My main legacy will be my children. I'll let others sort everything else out whenever my time here has passed. Yeah. I think that present moment idea with the most you can do in that is what creates the legacy. Mm -hmm. You know. All right. Last question. What is one thing you wish you would have known sooner? Oh my goodness. (laughs) Loaded question. That I'm enough. Mm. Yeah. (laughs) Would have figured that out. That would have, uh, you know, fast forward 40 years, but yeah. And and that comes from a place of humility, not a place of self-righteousness to just know that Everything that we've talked about where I can openly acknowledge that I was somewhat deficient previously, you know, scarcity mindset, not very patient, very selfish, like all of those things all rooted from not feeling enough. So if I would have known that then I probably could have sidestepped many of those behaviors. However, every single one of those behaviors put me literally 
in this incredibly uncomfortable chair sitting here right now with you guys uh, during this this podcast. So uh, one of the words that I've, I've always been really interested in and um, a gentleman named, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Dan Pink's work, but I'm, I'm a huge fan of his books. He's written some am- amazing books. His most recent book was about the power of regret and that regret is actually a good thing because it gets you to change your behavior moving forward. And, and, and I certainly concur with that. So all of these things that I can say kind of tongue in cheek with a smile that I maybe didn't handle very eloquently earlier in life has taught me a lesson and has put me where I am right now. So it's that butterfly effect. You change any of that stuff and I'm not where I am right now, both literally and metaphorically. Mm -hmm. And I'm very thankful for where I am literally and metaphorically. So I don't necessarily need to change anything. I've learned some painful lessons. I've been really hard headed. I've done, done and said some stupid things but they've all put me where I am now and I have a great life right now. So for that, I'm incredibly thankful. Would you change though the chair you're sitting on though, if you could? Oh, absolutely. And if I ever come back to do this, if it's a BYOC, bring your own chair, I may need to do that or at least get one of those donuts that I can sit on. But uh, no, this has been incredibly enjoyable. You guys are phenomenal. I've loved every second of this chair or no chair. This was this was tremendous. Thank you both so much. Oh, thank you. We started this podcast and our name, Gold Ivy, Gold. We want to be a light for others. You do too. And you're doing the damn thing. So thank you for your time. We know it's incredibly valuable. Yeah. Full of gold, full of wisdom. So everyone go follow Alan. And a little more gold, a little more wisdom. We leave our listeners with a quote, a piece of gold. So would you like to share yours? So a quote, um, boy, I am a bona fide quote nerd. I love quotes. I think in quotes every time I hear quotes, the way words are arranged. Uh, One of my favorite is, and I think is very poignant to this discussion, if nothing changes, nothing changes. So you got to lean in and make the change. This is Gold Ivy signing off. Listen to your truth and go chase your gold. 